Welcome to the Church of God International here in London. We are always very pleased to welcome you here. Well, good afternoon, brethren, and a very warm welcome to another Sabbath service uh, here from the United Kingdom, the Church of God International, here based in London. And uh, if you're, it's your first time here, we give you uh, warm greetings, warm greetings on this uh, on this Sabbath day. Well, as you can see, we are temporarily we are back uh, broadcasting online. Um, hopefully, it will be just uh, a short hiatus until uh, after the Feast of Tabernacles, but. Um, for the next week or so, we, we shall be broadcasting on our YouTube channel. So for those of you, again, for, who are here for the first time, a very warm welcome. So brethren, today I would like to review a subject that to this day Satan uses to confuse mankind. It's a subject that for many of us, indeed I would say for all baptised members, we should be well acquainted with this particular subject when it comes to what the Bible either does say or doesn't say about it. And as you can see, the subject today, the topic today, is the topic and subject of hell. And I would like to review it because I want to show you at the end of this message that the subject of hell is indeed an enemy of the gospel. You know, for us in the Church of God, brethren, it is vital that we are able to defend our belief and understanding of what this actually is. But just as important, it's, it's also important to understand the harm that this particular doctrine, the, the preconceived ideas that man has of an ever-burning hell, what harm this does to us in our ability to spread the gospel message. Now, I know many will think that this is a basic doctrine, and indeed it is a basic doctrine. I doubt whether I'll be teaching those who are familiar with the subject anything new. But if there are new people who are visiting us for the first time, who may have even stumbled upon us now or indeed in the future, I hope it does challenge what you may have as a preconceived idea or thought as to what the subject or the teaching of hell actually is. Now before I get into the main part of the message brethren, I think we need to remind ourselves of one or two things. And we'll look at Revelation 12 verse 9. Revelation 12 verse 9, we go straight to scripture. And the scripture says, a familiar scripture. Revelation 12 verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So here we see, brethren, everybody has been deceived. We have been deceived and we may well again in the future be deceived. Deceived on the basics, the basic doctrines of the church, the basic doctrines of the word of God. So again, although hell is indeed what one may call a basic doctrine, as we just see there, millions are deceived. So reinforcing and reviewing our understanding of this most abused truth, and I think it really is an abused truth, if we review it from scripture, this can only be for our good. And it stands us, brethren, in good stead for the fight ahead. It's also worth noting that when writing to the church in Thessalonica, Paul writes that indeed within the actual church, there would be a falling away. There will come men who are going to come in and deceive the church. And many will be deceived. Let's look at that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1, verses 1 to 3. Paul writes to the church. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. The context here, brethren, is that the Apostle Paul, when teaching about the return of Jesus Christ, as pictured by the Feast of Trumpets, which as we know is just a few days ahead of us here, he said that before Jesus Christ returns, there will be a falling away within the church. If we look at verses 10 and verse 11, you will see that the brethren, because they did not love the truth, then for that reason, God will send them a delusion that they will believe a lie. God, brethren, because of our, our lack of love for his word, maybe not even trusting in him, it's going to send a strong delusion that the very people who were once, or who may even at that time be within the church, they're going to start believing lies. So for the purpose of this message today, is the generally accepted legend of hell being an everlasting or ever burning fire, is that a lie? Yes, brethren, it is a lie. The subject of hell or the notion of hell being a place of everlasting or eternal torment is a lie and it is an enemy of the gospel message. For those of us who believe that we know what you might say the nuts and bolts of the truth of God, could we be swayed? Could we be deceived so that our understanding of basic doctrines becomes confused? The answer, brethren, is yes. Quite clearly from Scripture, the answer is yes. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, we don't need to turn there for the sake of time, but 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Peter talks about false teachers, bringing in false teachings, bringing in to where? Bring it into the church, false teachings. So who knows what's coming down the line for us, brethren, individually? Because surely we shall be tested in the days ahead. We cannot get too complacent. So if you and I, brethren, if we take the word of God seriously, I beg your pardon, if we do not take the word of God seriously, then he will, according to scripture, allow us to pursue our own ways. He will allow us, this is God the Father, will allow us to pursue our own ideals, which are contrary to God's own way indeed. And then the consequences of that, we will experience what happens when we believe lies. So it is of necessity that we review again what we may call the basics. We're all familiar with Satan being compared to a roaring lion. Again, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Satan, a roaring lion, brethren, who does not give up. A lying, deceitful building, a being, brethren, that never tires of playing the same old tune again and again and again and again. And he never tires because he knows that there will always be a chance of tripping some in the church up. There's always going to be a chance. So let's keep playing that same old tune. And brethren, if we in the church of God, if we believe that we are strong enough or immune just because we have God's Holy Spirit, then think on. You know, there are many people today within the Church of God who have a historical connection to the church. And we've seen things happen in our own lives within the church where unthinkable, anti-biblical teachings were accepted by those who, who at one stage who have supposedly proven all things. There were men and women that we looked up to as peers who 
when the full seed was sown again and again and again, there came a time when they accepted and embraced that false seed. They started to believe that which was what uh, was opposite to what, uh, again, which they had once proven to be false. Many people within the church, 40 plus years church attendance, who believed and started to defend, to defend theories like the theory of evolution, debating it. Can we believe that? Can we believe that someone who had been in the church for over 40 years starts to defend and debate the theory of evolution? Then we have others, again, abusing the doctrine of grace. And these are just some of many examples, as I'm sure many of you are, who are well aware that you can relate to. So really what I'm trying to say, brethren, is that the, the, the assault on God's people is never going to let up. It does not hurt to review the basics. And this subject of hell, being an enemy of the gospel, it's appropriate for the time that we're about to enter in with the Feast of Trumpets and the other holy day seasons that come soon after. The subject of hell, brethren, is a blatant misuse of the word of God. The subject of hell misuses the word of God and flies in the face of our creator. You know, it may surprise you to know that Jesus Christ spoke about hell. He spoke about hell many times. But what he said on the subject is never ever, it's not even remotely close to the common perception of what many without understanding have today. Understanding what hell is or how indeed the words translated as hell are, how they're used is foundational to our walk. Wrong understanding built on a bad foundation or, less, or a less than solid foundation, it will leave you exposed to the storms ahead. So again, although it's a well-worn doctrine of the Bible, don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted, brethren, that your conviction will not be challenged. Your conviction is going to be challenged endlessly until the very time of our own passing away or the time of Jesus Christ's return. Our walk with God is going to be challenged on a daily basis. So, like many subjects, brethren, the subject of hell, I can't cover every single aspect of it in a single presentation. But for this presentation, we're going to look at three things. What is the common perception of hell? What does the Bible tell us hell is? And lastly, we should look at the destructive nature. The destructive nature, brethren, of what a wrong understanding has on our loving father and the gospel message. So let's look at this common perception of hell. So right from the start, we could, all of us here within the Church of God, we would all agree that the idea of bad people or those who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ going to a, an everlasting fire in hell, we would all agree that is not biblical. It's not based on sound doctrine. But it does have an impact on the world that we live in. It does have an impact on those with whom we associate. You know, some believe in hell. Some don't believe in hell. And quite frankly, some others couldn't care less. They have no interest in it whatsoever. But in all of these notions, ideas, whether you believe, don't believe or couldn't care less. Wrapped up in all of these thoughts is the poison of deception. The poison of deception, brethren, in which the common denominator takes each and every one of us. If we get caught up in these ideas, it takes us away from God. We have already read Revelation 12, 9, that Satan had deceived the whole world. But in 2 Timothy 3, we are also warned of perilous times ahead in the last days. And we're not going to turn there again for the sake of time, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, it warns us of perilous times ahead. And as time goes on, I can foresee a time 
when the very clever Satan will actually use these scriptures and other scriptures around it to twist and bend out the shape even more so than he does today. He will twist the scriptures so that many deeply sincere people who see a world going astray, see a world going into chaos, many deeply sincere people may turn to the scriptures seeking comfort in a dusty old book that was once revered. At this time, at these perilous times, the church of God will still be loudly proclaiming the true gospel message. But we're, we're going to be up against it, brethren, because the prince of the power of the air, through false ideas, he's going to steer these people, these deeply sincere people who are looking for an answer in chaotic times, in perilous times. He's going to steer these people straight into the arms of false teachers. False teachers that will show them from scripture that we appear to go to a fiery hell when we die. False teachers that show us that we go to hell if we don't keep the commandments. If we don't keep the Sabbath. Unfortunately though, their Sabbath is a Sunday. You see how, how the truth will be twisted so much and deeply sincere people will be led astray hearing a false gospel. Now again, it, it's imperative, brethren, that we in the church know and understand the foundational, uh, foundational truths in Scripture. Truths that are divinely inspired, brethren. Now, if you mention the word hell, you're going to get all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas as to what it is and what it may not be. Again, the average man in the street who, who might even have a passing interest in spiritual things, along with many in mainstream Christianity, they will mostly and sincerely say that, place, uh, say that hell is a place of eternal punishment. They will say that it's a place of, uh, of fire, a fiery environment from which there's no escape. And you know what, as I was, as I was putting this message together, I was curious to see if such dogmatic teachings are still prevalent and taught today. And lo and behold, I came upon an essay uh, written for uh, another church. I came upon an essay that had within it its definition of hell. And this person says in their essay, hell is a place of eternal conscious torment for everyone who does not trust in Jesus Christ. This is still being taught, brethren. A place of eternal conscious torment for those who, don't, who do not believe in Jesus Christ. The American, uh, or Encyclopedia Americana says, it is a place that is generally understood as the abode of evil spirits. Lost and condemned souls, this is the place where they go after death, to suffer indescribable torments and eternal, eternal punishment. These brethren, these are just two examples of how the scriptures are still misunderstood. And if I may say, they're twisted. So is it true? How does such an idea, or ideas that may be in, in a, a similar kind of vein, how do they find their way into society? How do these ideas that cannot be found anywhere in scripture, how are they still peddled as truth? On what is it based now, many of you may or may not know the name Dante Alighieri. Now, once upon a time, his name was very widely known, but today, many people might not be familiar with his name. But it's generally accepted, brethren, that it was this man and his writings, and part of which contained an account of a fiery hell, it was this man and his writings that they were so popular that they've been taught and embraced as if they were indeed fact. Yet as popular even as he was, Dante was also influenced by other men. And one man who inspired Dante was a man by the name of Plato. In fact, Dante thought that Plato was actually divinely inspired. But for me, doing a little bit of research, here's the interesting thing 
that I found out, well, that, that not found out, but um, that uh, I found interesting regarding this particular man called Plato. Plato was born in the year 427 BC. Plato was born in the year 427 BC, and that alone should make us sit up and take notice, and I'll get back to that later. But Plato wrote a book called Phaedo about the immortality of the soul. This man that inspired Dante, the man that Dante thought was divinely inspired, he wrote a book on the immortality of the soul. And many believe that that is the book that's the origin, that's the origin of the, uh, the modern belief of the immortality of the soul. But even that is false, as we shall see. So Plato who wrote on the immortality of the soul, was born in 427 BC. What struck me here? The ideas of a fiery hell, the ideas of an immortality of the soul, they were around many, many years before Jesus Christ was even born. I find that, you know, when, when you actually come to study this subject, it's been around forever, brethren. No wonder we live in such a confused world. So we have Dante writing of an everlasting hell that will be the, will be the abode of wicked men and women, who himself was influenced by Plato, who wrote of the immortality of a soul, that is a soul that cannot die. And we have a fiery hell where people, or bad people, are tormented forever. It's accepted by millions to be a fact. And although Plato wrote of the immortality of the soul, as we shall see, it didn't originate with him because it had filtered down through the centuries. It had filtered down indeed from the very beginning of man's existence. And as with every false notion, whatever it may be that's out there in the world. As with every false notion, Satan is at the heart of it. The one that deceives the whole world. Surprise, surprise. Satan is at the heart of it. We read of this, brethren, in the Garden of Eden. And we read about Satan's encounter with Eve, where Eve told Satan, the serpent, that they were not allowed to eat of a certain tree. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 3, we read, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. That's, that was Eve to the serpent. The serpent's response, Satan's response, You're not going to die, you shall surely not die. And that, brethren, is where the deception of an immortal soul where you cannot die, that's where it all started. The concept for man having an immortal soul came from Satan himself and it continues to this day in one way, shape or form. You know, even the very people that had been given the law, the Jewish people, confusion reigned even at the time of Jesus Christ. These are the people who knew the Torah, they knew the law. Yet just confusion reigned among them regarding the immortality of the soul. At the time of Jesus Christ, there were what you might call three main groups or three sects of the Jews. They were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the SN Jews. They were, again, they would have all been taught the law. They would have known the writings and the prophets. They would have known from scripture, brethren, that when you die, there's no consciousness. They would have found that in Psalm 146, verse 4. They would have also known that when one dies, the spirit within man goes back to God who gave it. And they would have found that in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. Yet the Pharisees believed in the immortality of the soul. The Pharisees took hook, line and sinker. Genesis 3, 4. You shall surely not die. And what of the Sadducees? 
Well, the Sadducees didn't believe in anything of the like. They didn't even believe in spirits. The people that have, again, been taught from the law, been taught from the word of God. The Sadducees didn't even believe in spirits. So if they don't believe in the spirits, well, there's no Satan around, is there? There's no Satan or evil influence to, uh, to uh, interfere with you. The Sadducees didn't even believe in the resurrection. So no returning Messiah. You see how Satan gets into every, everything with his confusion. The SN Jews also believed in the immortality of the soul. So let us, brethren, let us be humble. Those of us, whether we're in the church five minutes, 50 years, whatever it may be, let us be humble and acknowledge that even if we know the law, we can still be deceived. There will be no let up. And even the most fundamental teachings, brethren, of Scripture shall continue to be under attack. So moving on, what does the Bible actually tell us that hell is? Now, I'm not going to spend too much time here, brethren, but it is important to address the terms in the Bible that are commonly translated as hell. Because the word hell does appear some, I think it's 54 times in Scripture. It's not a word that's just been dreamt up. It's an actual word. But the word hell is a wonderful example of how without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, where men are left to their own devices, ideas run amok. So the words used in the Bible, translated as hell, are as follows. The first one we shall find in the Old Testament is the only word in the Old Testament that is uh, translated as hell. And it's the word Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. And it means nothing more, brethren, than below ground, subterranean, a pit or a grave. You know, you can look this word up in the Old Testament and every single time when read in context, it simply means grave, pit, the deepest depths. Never a fiery place of eternal punishment. Let's look at some examples. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, 22, and, and bear with me as I, as I go through this section of scripture. Deuteronomy 32, verse 22. For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Now, we, we need to read this verse in context, brethren, because the context here is that God is very angry with Israel. And they had provoked him and uh, sacrificed to false gods. So let's read in scripture. Let's go back to verse 16. Deuteronomy 32, verse 16. They provoked him, that's God. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that newly came up, or that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Verse 18, of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and has forgotten God that formed you. They had forgotten their creator, brethren. Verse 19, and when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be for they are a very froward generation children in whom is no faith verse 21 they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not god they have provoked me to anger with their vanities and i will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people i will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. That's the context, brethren. We can clearly see there is no mention 
there is no implication of an everlasting punishment or people being tormented mercilessly. No, in the context we read there, it is simply that God will bring Israel down. His anger will bring Israel down. Down where? To the darkest depths. You know, the, the New English Translation Bible makes these observations referring that particular scripture. They say, Sheol here, or Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, in this particular passage, refers not to hell and hellfire. Why not? Because it's a much later concept. Even the, the New English Translation Bible acknowledges that the idea of hell and hellfire is a much later concept, a much later idea. He says here, it's not to hell and hellfire, which is a much later concept, but to the innermost parts of the earth, as low down as one could get. So there is a, an acknowledgement. It's nothing to do with hellfire. It's just a subterranean, the grave, the innermost depths, the deep and dark depths, as low as one could get. Another example is found in Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. Where Jonah says, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So here we, we're all familiar with the subject of Jonah. Even school, school children, hopefully even to this day, are still familiar with the story of Jonah and the big fish, the big whale. But here we see Jonah crying out from hell. But in this instance, again, referring to a grave, the deepest depths, darkness. This hell is the darkness of the whale's body. And the translators use the word Sheol again and render it as hell. And for our third example regarding the word Sheol, Psalm 86, verse 13. For great is thy mercy towards me, writes David, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Here we see David praising, praising God for the mercy that he showed unto him by delivering him from death or delivering him from the depths of darkness that comes with being in the grave. So I hope it's clear that this word Sheol, the only time that this word is translated uh, as hell in the Old Testament. I hope it's clear that it does mean the grave, a pit or the deepest depths. It's not a fiery place of eternal punishment or punishing. Okay, so let's move on to the, uh, the New Testament now. And we'll look at the words that are used here, translated as hell, of which there are three. That's right, brethren, there are three words in the New Testament, all translated as hell, and all, as we shall see, with very different meanings. The first one, translated as hell, is the word Hades, which again, simply means grave. And there's nothing difficult in understanding this. All scholars freely admit that this is what it means. It is the grave, or a place where those who have died who are, who are now dead. In Acts chapter 2, we see Peter speaking on the day of Pentecost, and he's obviously addressing the audience. And he makes reference to the fact that it was through their deeds that Jesus Christ was buried, yet he rose from the dead. Then Peter references King David, who made a prophecy concerning Jesus. And we'll see that in verse 25. Peter says, For David speaks concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Verse 27, Because you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul, that's Jesus' soul, Jesus' body, was not left in hell. Or in other words, his, his body was not left in Hades. He was not left in the grave. 
and neither did his flesh see corruption. But isn't it interesting that people overlook the fact the people that you know, that uh, perpetrate this idea of hell being an everlasting, tormenting, fiery place that where the dead go, sinners go, bad people go. Isn't it interesting that if hell is a place of eternal punishment, then according to that view, and with reference to verse 31, Jesus would have at least paid a visit there. That's how ludicrous that subject or that thinking is. If Jesus Christ uh, was not left in hell, was not left in the grave as we understand it, but not left in a never burning hell, did he not at least pay a visit there? Of course, brethren, when, when, when you view view that thinking through the lens of scripture, it's preposterous. And quite frankly, Jesus Christ was without, was without sin and therefore needs no explanation. But such is the deceit of Satan. He allows people to be deceived into thinking that there is such a place as a fiery hell. The next word translated as hell is found in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And we'll read this here. He says, For if God did not spare angels, 2 Peter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept unto the judgment. Now the word hell here is the word Tartarus. I'm not sure if I pronounce that correctly, but uh, it's the word Tartarus. That's how I read it. And it's found only once in the whole Bible. This word Tartarus or hell is the only place that that word is found in the whole Bible. And it's a word that, again, when read in context, it doesn't even refer to mankind. It doesn't even refer to human beings, but it refers to fallen angels. And it's a place where God has put them as a place of restraint until a future time to come. Now, a complementary verse can be found in Jude. Jude verse 6 says, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains, under darkness, this is under, in, in Tartarus, in hell, until the judgment of the great day. That is a day to come, brethren, and a time when Satan and all of his demons will be judged and their works and their influence will be destroyed for good. So now we come to the third word, which is translated as hell. And many might even be familiar with this particular word, but it's the Greek word Gehenna. And it is a word that Jesus Christ used on many, many occasions, and he used it to great effect to impress on his audience certain lessons. And it's used in scripture um, in relation to an everlasting fire. Ooh, everlasting fire. And where worms do not die. But again, as we see, if we read it in context, it's really quite straightforward. There is, there's nothing complicated. Why? Well, because we have already seen, we already know that when one dies, there's no consciousness. When one dies, the spirit in man goes back to God. So we can say confidently that no one will be burning forever in an everlasting fire. But as we say, we must prove all things. So let us look at this hell fire, this Gehenna fire. Well, the word Gehenna was termed, uh, which came from the word, from the from the valley of Hinnom. It's an actual place. So Jesus Christ was referring to Gehenna fire. He was, he, was, he was referring to the valley of Hinnom. He's talking to people. And it's an actual place with an infamous history. And a place that Jesus could refer to with great impact just to get his point across. Just maybe like someone would use um, Auschwitz as an example. If, if one was to mention Auschwitz, all sorts of images and thoughts come into your head as to what that place represents. The Valley of Hinnom 
where this hell fire, this Gehenna fire, uh, would burn, is no different. It had a history. And it's also got a history that's left in scripture. And it would have been very well known by Jesus' audience. And part of its history, brethren, is found in Second Chronicles. Please turn with me to Second Chronicles. Now, Jesus Christ didn't waste his breath. Jesus Christ, when he was talking to his audience, would have used things that they, would, they could relate to, they would understand. And they would have known of the history of the Valley of Hinnom. In 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 1, we'll read verses uh, 1 to 3. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David's father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and made also molten images for Baalim. Verse 3. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burnt his children in the fire, and the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Verse 6, and he caused his children, this is Ahaz, he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. This, brethren, is the disgusting history of Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. A history that is an abomination to God Almighty. And it's also a place where we're seeing Jeremiah. God referred to this place as a valley of slaughter. There's nothing nice about this place. Jeremiah 7 verse 30. The children of Israel, uh, children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to pollute it. They have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that it shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hermon, but the valley of slaughter. For they shall bury in Tophet till there be no place. And the carcasses of these people shall be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth, and none shall fray them away. Brethren, in the days when Jesus Christ was on earth, he used the valley of Hinnom to symbolise and reinforce the wrath of God. It's a valley of slaughter, brethren. His audience would have known the history connected with this place. They were fully aware of what went on. In fact, if they wanted to, they could get up from where they were and go and visit the place. It, it was a place with which they were still well accustomed with. Because even at the time of Jesus Christ, the Valley of Hinnom, brethren, was still a place of fire. It was a place where dead were sometimes thrown, along with dead animals and general rubbish. Again, there's nothing pleasant about this place. The fires burned all day. That is the everlasting fire that Jesus Christ was referring to. The fires burned all day. So again, thus the term everlasting fire Jesus Christ made reference to this Gehenna fire brethren on no less than 11 occasions and again just for the sake of time we're going to just look at one or two to get the sense Mark chapter 9 Mark chapter 9 and verse 43 to 46 Jesus Christ preaching saying if your hand offends you cut it off it is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, to go into the valley of Hinnom, to go into the place where there is fire that will never be quenched. Where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. 
If your foot offends you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life than having two feet be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Again, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. To the Pharisees, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 23, verse 33. You serpents, he said, you generation of vipers. These are people that know better. These are people that know the law. Yet he said, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation or the judgment of hell? Or how can you escape the judgment that will be finalized, finished with you being sentenced to death in the valley of Hinnom? But, you know, ironically, brethren, these verses that we've just read, given, especially in the context and the history that I've given, these are just some of the verses that some use to qualify that when we die, we go to a bad place called hell, where people will torm be tormented forever. Where people will, will be burnt in everlasting hell, where their worm dies not. That's a, another subject for another day. But in context, you would see, if you were to study it, that this is people... Jesus Christ was referring to because there were always something, there's always something to burn. Carcasses of dead animals, you know, one after another. There's always going to be worms there. That's what it means by their worm dies not. You know, when, when, when the rubbish is there, the maggots are breeding, whatever was thrown in there is going to create, you know, uh, the insects will arrive, the maggots get, get born, where their worm dies not. But it only, the worms only exist until there's nothing left to burn. The fires will only burn until there's nothing left to burn. But if you keep throwing fuel on the fire, that is why the term everlasting fire comes from. But when you think about it, will a loving God, will a loving God condemn people who don't know of his ways, have never heard of Jesus Christ? Will he condemn them to an everlasting torment? Again, such an idea, brethren, is preposterous. The verses we've just read allude to a time, a future time, that according to the word of God is a time when after everyone has had their only chance of salvation. Again, because many have died not knowing anything about Jesus Christ or the scriptures. It is a time when all will have been taught what sin is. Who Jesus Christ is. And it will be a time when you will be judged by God's standards. And if after all that teaching and education, it is then that they will end up in what the Bible calls the lake of fire. As illustrated by Jesus Christ and the valley of Hinnom. The ultimate wages that come from the willful rebellion and sin. I mean, uh, just again, getting back to this everlasting fire notion. If you go to Jude 7, we see there about uh, eternal fire. Jude 7 says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the towns near them, having like these given themselves up to unclean desires and gone after strange flesh, have been made an example, undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Well, the obvious question to ask brethren is is Sodom and Gomorrah or are Sodom and Gomorrah are they still burning it talks about an eternal fire brethren the fires have been quenched because everything that was there to burn has been burnt up there's nothing left the fire has been put out because everything's been consumed so let us move on now, brethren, to our, our third and our final point. Why is the teaching of hell? And why is it an enemy of the gospel? I'll tell you why, brethren. Because the teaching of hell, as perpetuated by the masses today, it flies in the face of a very loving God. 
The teaching of hell abuses the grace of a loving God that doesn't want anyone to perish. God doesn't want anyone to perish in a fire. Everyone will be given their chance. He wants all to inherit eternal life. Jesus Christ, brethren, came preaching the good news of the coming kingdom of God. He knew that some would respond now. But because of Satan and his demons, he knew that most would not respond. He also knew that indeed most would never hear the true gospel message. Today, brethren, is no different. The true gospel message is being preached. We believe we are preaching the true gospel message. We believe this is part of preaching the gospel. But never more, brethren, in the time that we are living in, never more has this gospel message been more ridiculed. And the world is reaping what it sows. The teaching of hell, brethren, is an enemy of the gospel because, among other things, this teaching hoodwinks people. It confuses people. Or to put it another way, those without the understanding of scripture, they experience a living torment. They don't know where their loved ones have gone after death. We know that the Bible says they are asleep. The man in the street, ignorant of scripture, has no idea where their loved one is. Now, why would a loving God allow them, the bereaved, to be in a tormented living hell, to coin a modern day phrase? Brethren, the teachings of hell are an abomination. It's not just some fairy story that it doesn't really mean much. The more you go into it, the teaching of hell is an abomination initiated by the seeds of Satan. And the wickedness of such teachings, brethren, they must not be underplayed. You know, as we know, everyone will get their chance to be in the kingdom of God. And Satan hates that. Let me just repeat that. We know through scripture that everyone who has ever lived will get their chance to be in the kingdom of God. And Satan hates that. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll just read a few verses here, familiar verses, a lengthy passage, but please uh, bear with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal, this flesh and blood, must put on immortality. 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your, as, that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. A lengthy passage, brethren, that says so much, but pa a passage, brethren, that we know points to those who will be in the first resurrection. Hopefully that is you and I as we live our lives according to the word of God. That is what that passage refers to. It shows that death is defeated by life, eternal life. And that's granted by God the Father to those who responded to the call and overcame in this lifetime. But brethren, what of the others who didn't respond? What of the others who got caught up 
in the deceptions of this world? What of those who never knew? Revelation 20 verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead, the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And when they were when they were living again, or when they will live again, what are they going to do? What will they do when they when they are resurrected again? Brethren, they will be taught the ways of God. Isaiah 30 verse 21 says, And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left. Or to paraphrase and put it in modern day language. Here is your chance my friend. This is the way. This is the way. This is what the scriptures say. Brethren. The notion of a fiery everlasting tormenting hell. Will be shown up for the lie that is is. The notion of a fiery everlasting uh, place where the conscious are tormented flies in the face, denies, it denies that God is God. He denies that God is our creator, that he is a loving God and it makes out God to be a liar. The teaching of hell perpetuates the immortal soul in which you have two options, heaven and harps. Or hell with its pain and hurt. How does that equate? How does that equate to a loving God? The common teaching of hell denies the grace of God. Denies the love of God. It says that a loving God allows those who have never heard his name to be punished. Punished for what? How can you be punished for something that you've never understood or heard or had no idea of the doctrine of hell brethren hold this holds this world captive it's imprisoned the whole world the reality of hell brethren is is far removed from scripture i beg your pardon the reality of hell is far removed from the the common understanding that is in the world it is the deliverance from the grave there's no such thing as an ever burning hell. You know, it's, com it's a comforting truth that knowing what the, what the Bible describes hell as. And it's, it's, it's interesting that, or comforting I should say, that as we approach the day of trumpets and, and the days beyond, when we understand what hell is, knowing the truth gives us a real comfort. Hell in the Bible, brethren, is simply the grave or a place of restraint for fallen angels or as depicted by Jesus Christ as the Valley of Hinnom. It's a place where evil things took place with fire, where dead bodies and rubbish were thrown to be burnt up. And it's used by Jesus Christ to show that death by fire will be the fate of all who reject him once they have had their chance, not before. And it won't be an everlasting torment with some little demon going around prodding you and poking you. No, brethren, this is very much the opposite of that. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, it says, The fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, shall have their place, have their part in the lake of fire, or in the lake which burns with fire, and brimstone, which is the second death. That is the fate of all brethren, who, after rejecting God, that's where they'll end up, where they're going to be given, everyone is going to be given every single chance to embrace the word of God. You know, brethren, when we, when we give these messages, and we, when we, and we speak to you. It, we, we do so to reinforce the teachings of the Bible. And we want to show you from scripture that these ancient words. They are alive and they are relevant 
they are relevant brethren to this present day. No, and if it's not obvious as to the reference to this or to the relevance of this message, let me tell you plainly what it is. Hell is an enemy of the gospel. But as an extension to that, false teachings and deception rule today. Lies rule and deception is king, brethren. And we have been given an understanding that precious few have ever had. The world, as you know, I'm talking to the converted, the world, as you know, is so deceived, blissfully unaware. And in most cases, it is our duty, that's us here, when we give our messages. And again, when we, after we have our, our, our after sermon discussions, either online or literally, we're here to sharpen each other. Iron sharpens up each other. You know, Satan has done the most incredible job. Again, most people, or many, don't believe he exists, and many couldn't care less. But just as important, within the deception are those who do believe that he exists. But they have such a distorted view or opinion that it bears no relevance to what the scriptures say. And thus, the deception continues. When man, brethren, under Satan's influence, believes that the gospel is irrelevant, and when the teaching of God's word is relegated to the, to the rubbish tip, when there is no opposition, then the flood gates are opened. And I suggest, brethren, that Satan has been largely successful. The word of God, the scriptures, is meaningless to most. Therefore, its contents are unknown. So let's open the floodgates to hoodwink men even more. The floodgates of deception, brethren, are open. We need to make sure we're on higher ground. We don't get swept away in the lies. Don't become comfortable. Don't become complacent. Understand the basics. You know, every aspect of anything good today, anything good and decent, even by man's standards, is now being brought into question it, as if by some unseen force. You know, man he seems to be on some kind of bizarre mission to rewrite the most basic and inherently good moral codes that God has put into us. Brethren, we need to be aware and we need to be on our guard and we need to be alert. New ways of thinking are being promoted and being drip fed. And the more these these ways are and teachings are taught, dripped into society, the more they will take hold, the more they will be accepted. For example, and this is outrageous, but let me just, again, bear with me. It was recently claimed by an official that there is the potential for all of us, that's you and me, there is the potential for all of us to have paedophilia tendencies and that we should be understanding that those with them cannot help themselves they cannot help these urges that they that they have now every man is made in the image of god we are to hate men we are to love one another but god's law is god's law are we really expected to tolerate such things is there really a paedophile lurking within you how dare that thought of evil or that evil seed be sown under the guise of understanding those who carry out such vile acts but let me tell you this brethren the more they say it the more it will be believed who would have ever thought it possible that such thoughts could be given any credence or tolerance? And this is what I mean, brethren. I use that as an illustration to say deception will never cease. Deception will never cease, brethren. So back to my main point. Hell or the misteaching thereof. It is an enemy of the gospel. For each and every one of us, brethren, I say, know the basics. Know what your Bible says. 
Do not become complacent. Revisit this subject for yourself. Review it and reinforce what you may already know. Understand what hell really is and come away convicted that the traditional teaching of hell it is an enemy of the gospel. Happy Sabbath, brethren, and God be with you all.